Good morning. Welcome to DrupalCon. I am so excited to be here with you this week. This is such a special time for us to unite as a community and to level up our skills and to spend time contributing back to the project. And what I love most about this week is that we created this special experience together. I am deeply grateful for the Drupal Association staff and their commitment to wake up every day ready to serve you in our mission. And our mission is to unite the community to help you build and promote the software. And they work really hard to hear and understand your needs and to work with you to build solutions that move the project forward. And you know, we have achieved a lot together this year, and I'd like to just highlight some of those. Together we created industry pages on Drupal.org. And these are great ways to showcase all the amazing work that you've done and how you've been helping your customers and your patients and digital citizens out there with amazing solutions. And so now that we have been able to hear the needs of the business community and start creating content that you can use, <coughs> excuse me, that you can use to sell Drupal. And we also heard the need from last year's community keynote, um, Enzo, who said that it's really important that we start offering localized content on Drupal.org. And so we created these geo-targeted pages and got case studies from community members that submitted them. And we have included them on each of these pages. So for example, if you are uh, in Europe and you are looking for more information about Drupal and government, you can go to the page and it will serve up the case study of uh, the City of London, which has really great information and really highlights the best of what Drupal can do for our digital citizens. And then together, we also improve the contribution experience by opening the floodgates with project application process. And we heard the, the pain and frustration of having projects created, but not ready to uh, be shared with the world. And so we worked with the security team and the, tech, uh, the technical working group uh, and we were able to solve this problem together. And what's great about it is we increased um, project creation by 58%. That's significant. That helps the project, and let's face it, it feels a lot better for those that spend the time to contribute back to the project. And of course, we spend a lot of time together creating this special week. And so I want to thank all the volunteers who put in hours and hours of their time creating the program and special events that make this week so rich and rewarding. So if you have volunteered to help create DrupalCon, will you please stand up? Come on. <laughs> Thank you. We could not do this without you. The European community is vibrant and passionate. You are very important to the Drupal project. Just in Dries' blog post, you could see that you are responsible for 44% of contribution last year. That is a really big deal. And we know that DrupalCon is one of the many ways that help you come together and contribute in such a big way. We also know that DrupalCon is not meeting all of your needs. And it's also not at a price point, it's not affordable enough for everyone to come who wants to come and be part of this magical week. And so you might have read my very, very long blog series, or you might have heard that we are starting to look for a new model so that we can make DrupalCon better for you and more affordable as well. And we are working with the community to find what that model is and I know that it is going to result in a better path forward. And what I'm excited about is I know this model will be able to be applied to other parts of the world that are not getting DrupalCon today. And all of this is very exciting. And so please know, this is not the last DrupalCon. There will be many more in our future. We're just going to take a pause 
so that we can rethink the best way forward by working with the community next year. And so, uh, we are already starting to work with the community on ideas, and we started that um, over the last couple of weeks in forums and at the community summit yesterday. We'll continue to do that this week. And what is wonderful is that there are many ideas already surfacing, and that is very encouraging. And to make a decision, we're going to need a process, a process that works for the Drupal Association as well as for the European community. And I have asked these eight volunteers from Europe who have a lot of experience in running events to advise me so that I come up with the best process that is clear and transparent and works for all of us. And we're going to be working on that this week and we'll be putting that out to the community shortly after DrupalCon because what we want to do is um, make a decision this winter of where or how we're going to do DrupalCon in 2019. So stay tuned. There's going to be lots of really, really exciting things coming. Um, you'll start seeing the ideas. We'll make it very transparent. Um, I'm very encouraged and excited about this. So again, if you want to participate in the discussions, we do have some birds of a feather. We want to do a lot to support camps next year while we're doing our rethink. And um, we will have a boff so I can hear what your needs are. Uh, so please come to that if you have anything you want to express. And, and we will work really hard to do that next year. And then there's the other boff that uh, we can talk about the future of DrupalCon Europe there as well. So one of the reasons this week is so special is because our local hosts have put in so much time and energy they held uh, a full day of programming yesterday, trainings and summits, and um, it was so well run. And I couldn't believe how packed their rooms were. They really filled a need, and I'm very grateful for what the Austrian community has done. And they have so much more for you, and I'd like to invite them onto the stage so that uh, they can tell you about it. Hello fellow Drupal kings and queens. The Austrian community is more than it seems. When writing this rhyme, we could only guess if our Monday events will become a success. Invited on stage, five minutes to complete. Okay, Megan, we accept the dirty deed. Oi da. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> the party tonight will be a ball, and we expect you to join it all. There's DJs and life facts and all this stuff, and swag bags so heavy you can't carry enough. Jam's opening tonight will be a blast, so get your blinky bow tie on fast. <laughs> <laughs> no dress code required, but there'll be a World Sprint. For the issue, Tombola, we won't give you no hint. Oi da. <laughs> I kind of broke that. Broken. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just broke this. But reaching the venue is really easy. There's food places around and it won't get cheesy. For more insider tips and no infinite loop. Come over to our booth with a big fat woo! That was it. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> okay, well, anyhow, they're amazing. And we're working on the slides really fast. And we're just going to move into the housekeeping. Has everyone found uh, access to Wi-Fi? Yeah, anyone need to know how to find Wi-Fi? I didn't think so. So, we're gonna skip that slide when it comes up. Let's see, what else? 
Does anyone know what the social media handles are? Who, who can tell me? Hashtag Oida? Hashtag Oida? No. <laughs> <laughs> <Oida! laughs> okay, well, I'll just keep going because I've memorized the slides. Okay, after Dries' keynote, we are going to stay here for our group photo. No, nope, we're not staying here. We're going to go out the door to the left in the mall. That's where the photo is going to be. <laughs> okay, we're going to skip over Wi Fi. I think you've already figured this out. Here are their social media handles. No hashtag OIDA. So sorry. <laughs> and of course, we all need coffee. We got up pretty early this morning. And so we have free coffee in the exhibit hall this morning. And then there's also paid coffee available the rest of the day. And for lunch, we have a two hour lunch break that allows you to decide if you want to go to a session or eat. So they'll be going simultaneously. And um, just a few good points is vegetarian is in the regular buffet line. But if you order a special meal, you have a special table to go to. And it's in the back wall. You can see the map. And we want to keep DrupalCon a very welcoming place for all of us. And so please make sure you're mindful of the code of conduct. Uh, if you do run into a situation and you want to talk to someone, we have the community working group uh, members, Rachel Lawson and Adam Hill here, and this is how you contact them, um, or you can just uh, submit an online report. And we have lots of activities happening tonight, starting with the opening reception. So please meet us in the exhibit hall where we can kick this off. And of course, the big event of the night is the ball. Uh, please make sure you come. They have put so much energy into this. It's going to be a very special evening. Uh, and then plan for uh, women in Drupal so we can celebrate diversity tomorrow night. And of course, Thursday would not be complete without trivia night. So I hope you can join us there. Friday, well actually all week are contribution sprints, such an important part of this DrupalCon, and uh, it will conclude with the sprint day on Friday. Uh, so please, if you are new to contributing, come to the first time sprinter workshop, um, and we also have general sprints and mentored course sprints all day. We do have one session change, so uh, Tuesday from 12 to 1300, 1 o'clock. In Schubert 1 to 2, the PHP session will now be Breakthrough Large Scale Drupal Projects with BHAT. And as I mentioned, we have birds of a feather. Um, if you are looking for the boards to know what we are talking about and which room and when, uh, look for that board at the top of the escalator on level one. And please, 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 after your session, fill out the evaluation form. It is really helpful for our speakers to get feedback. They put a lot of time into coming up with great sessions for you. And they want to do the best job possible. So please take the time to fill out the forms. They would really appreciate it. And in our exhibit hall, um, in the program guide, you might see the map look a little different. I want to show you the updated map. Um, because FFW and SiteGround um, are just in a slightly different place than what we originally thought. And we want to make sure you can find them. All right, so big thank you to all of the sponsors who have helped us make this event special as well as affordable. I don't know if you read my blog post, but all the numbers are there, and we can't do this without sponsors. They help subsidize all the costs for the venue, and the Wi-Fi, the food, and the catering. But more importantly, they come and have great information to share with you. They can teach you about training and how to find a job at one of their agencies. So please be sure to go in the exhibit hall to check them out. And uh, I also want to thank our supporting partners. They are the ones who are coming, like crowdsourcing their funds um, so we can pay for Drupal.org, the infrastructure, the maintenance, the new um, um, improvements to the page. Um, and so raise your hand if you use Drupal.org. That's right, all of you. 
So let's thank them. We have our signature supporters and premium supporters and classic supporters that are from digital agencies as well as hosting companies and uh, technology companies too that integrate with, with Drupal. They all want to give back and they know it's not about leads, it's about supporting our infrastructure that we need to keep building the software. And so with that, I'd like to invite our sponsor of the day, Pantheon, uh, to come to the stage. Please welcome David Needham and Tessa Creasel. Welcome to DrupalCon Vienna. Woo! Yeah, Drupal really wouldn't be what it is today without the community and contributions from people just like you. So before we bring in the person that made Drupal possible, let's get to know the community behind it, all of you. So we're going to try something a little different. Uh, you might have seen it kind of uh, leaked on the screen a little bit ago, but uh, we're going to do a live poll. So we're going to ask a few questions to help you get to know the community here at DrupalCon a little bit better. We're going to show some questions up on the screen and just pull out your phone or your computer, uh, type in, uh, as you answer, it'll show up live on the screen, and then we'll be able to talk about that. So if you haven't done so already, I don't think our slide's up correctly yet. There we go. Join us at slido.com, hashtag DCVienna. Uh, first question, we really want to know where all of you are from. Yeah, so one of the things I love about DrupalCon is I get to experience other cultures. I, I get to come uh, overseas, I get to meet people that I do code with all the time online. And it's amazing for me to uh, you have that experience of contributing code and talking to people on Drupal.org all the time, and then you see them and you meet them in person, and they're not, they're not always the people that you expect. And so I appreciate the experience of getting to come to DrupalCon, hang out with my friends, and meet new people. We see the results. They're popping in. Europe is winning by a landslide, obviously. Oh, Europe. Big surprise. Woo! Three hundred and ninety-four. If what? Oh no. Where's that at? New Zealand. New Zealand. We're gonna do a call out to New Zealand. <laughs> it looks like it looks like four hundred and ninety-three, four hundred and ninety-nine people. Oop, five oh six. Yay! Right. Right, next question. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. What is your favorite thing about DrupalCon? So for me, uh, actually, Tessa, let me ask you, what is your favorite thing about DrupalCon? So my favorite thing about DrupalCon is getting to meet new people and figuring out what they do with Drupal. Yeah, so for me, I love the sessions. I love being able to go to sessions and hear from people, uh, see things that they're really passionate about. That gets me excited. But like I mentioned earlier, the community. <laughs> Getting to meet people that I only see at DrupalCon every year is really exciting for me. Uh, it's a big reason why I come here. I'm not going to lie. I don't think we expected to see beer as a winner um, <laughs> by a landslide. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go to the next one, as fun as this one is. Uh, so who introduced you to Drupal? David, who introduced you to Drupal? So when I, when I was still at university, I had a, uh, a college professor, Stephen Merrill, who, uh, who taught me all about Drupal. So we had the class, it was the final project. He told everyone that you could pick whatever CMS you want, and literally everyone else in the class picked WordPress. Uh, which is okay, but he encouraged me. He helped me to learn Drupal, uh, helped me to go to my first camp and give my first talk. Uh, so Mr. Stephen Merrill is, is the person who introduced me to Drupal. How about you, Tessa? So um, I actually started my open source development days in Joomla. Don't shame me. Um, and I was asked to work on a Drupal 4.8 project. Um, I did it, I finished it, but I vowed to never touch Drupal again. Uh, and now today, I actually really love Drupal, and it's awesome, like, detailed functionality. 
All right, so um, we are from Pantheon. Uh, my name is Tessa. I'm an agency and community engineer at Pantheon, which means I get to help awesome developers learn how to be successful on our platform. I'm personally from Minnesota in the United States. Uh, if you want to find me online, TessaK22. Yeah, and my name is David Needham. I'm the agency and community training manager at Pantheon. Uh, one of the things I really love about Pantheon and about our uh, team, specifically the training team, is that our job is to help developers be successful on Pantheon, to use our developer tools and to really become familiar with both Drupal and WordPress and to feel really good about making lots of money, building websites for their customers using Pantheon. Uh, so that's why we're here. Um, but so <laughs> there's this photo uh, of the first time I got to meet Dries. And this was at, uh, this was DrupalCon DC. Uh, and and this, this was a really important time for me uh, as a new person to the Drupal community because I was still in school at the time. I was uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and I wasn't really sure and I was doing a little bit of Drupal and uh, I got to meet Dries and it was a big deal for me to be able to shake his hand and get this picture and it, it meant a lot to me. I, I really appreciated that. So, uh, yeah. So in seeing David's photo, I realized that everyone probably has a Drupal story. Maybe you've met Dries and he was an inspiration to you. Maybe you've had someone else that has introduced you to Drupal. Um, and we want to hear about it. So we actually created an Instagram account. Uh, the account's Drupal Community Love. Feel free to follow it. Uh, tell us your story. Share your photos and be sure to use the hashtag Drupal Community. And do that throughout all of DrupalCon Vienna and we look forward to seeing your submissions. Yeah, and, and not just DrupalCon Vienna, because I mean, the hashtag will be around forever. So feel free to post photos from previous DrupalCons or other events where you've really felt the love of the Drupal community uh, and continue using it too. I mean, Instagram will probably be there forever, right? Maybe. All right, so without further ado, it's our pleasure to introduce you to the Drupal project lead, Dries. Hey everyone, let me see which clicker to use. Um, for who is this the first time they're attending DrupalCon? Maybe raise your hand. All right, I have a lot of people. So in good tradition, I'm going to do the Dries note. It's also called the state of Drupal. And so I'm going to give you an update on what's happening in the world of Drupal. Um, but maybe, you know, unlike at other conferences, if you're new to Drupal, if you're like, you know, looking at evaluating Drupal, uh, don't be afraid of the Dries note either because um, a lot of our competitors, they go like, rah, 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 here's all the great things in Drupal. <laughs> and they never talk about the things that need to be improved upon. So not only am I going to talk about some of the great things, uh, but I will also talk about some of the things um, that I think we need to do better at, right? I think it's important for us uh, to talk about. So specifically, I wanted to show you that Drupal is growing and that Drupal is actually very healthy, uh, but also that we're changing. You know, there are things that are changing around us, inside and outside of Drupal. And some of these changes, they lead to questions, maybe sometimes to concerns, maybe sometimes even to uh, frustration. So I also want to talk about that today uh, and propose some path forwards as well. So that's at a high level some of the things I would like to cover. But let's start with how Drupal is, is growing. So there's a lot of different ways we can measure growth. Uh, but one of the ways is to look at the activity uh, or the engagement from the contributors on Drupal.org, you know, the issue activity. And so we see that compared to last year, um, there was 22% you know, more issues fixed or closed on Drupal.org. And that spans both core and contrib. Right? So that's a pretty healthy increase in one year. Uh, similarly, we see that there was a pretty big increase in the number of individual contributors on Drupal.org, again, across both core and contrib. Same thing is true for organizations. The number of organizations contributing uh, increased by 26% across, uh, across core and contrib, so all great things. Um, as Megan mentioned in uh, her opening statement, uh, Europe is very important for Drupal. And one of the things that we learned from this analysis, from looking at the code contributions on Drupal.org, is that actually 45%, or almost 45% of all of the code contributions uh, come from Europe. 
which is a big deal, right? Um, obviously, there's a lot of other ways to contribute. Um, people can organize sprints, they can write documentation, they can sponsor events, they can do mentoring. Um, and these kinds of contributions are also critical to Drupal success. Uh, unfortunately, they're a little bit harder to measure, and so it's harder to report on them and to show you how these things have uh, gotten better. But one thing that we did measure is the number of people attending Drupal camps in Europe. And what you see is that the um, you know, number of people or the number of people going to these events has also steadily increased year over year. And more recently, there was also a Drupal business survey done. Um, Exove and Wanshu, they um, surveyed basically the Drupal agency owners or the managers or the C-level executives of all of the Drupal shops. And they got about 240 people to answer the survey. And what the survey results show is that most of the Drupal businesses are actually doing quite well. Almost 50% of them said that um, they grew, you know, both their Drupal um, you know, sales pipeline is growing as well as the deal sizes are growing. So what that suggests is that the ecosystem, um, you know, is recovering, is growing, and is doing pretty well. One of the questions in the same survey, which I thought was really interesting, is the question of, you know, which version of Drupal do you use, right? And so these business owners then, uh, you know, answered that question. And what you can see is that by 38%, of the uh, people that answered the survey said that they only use Drupal 8 right now. 25% uh, use mostly Drupal 8 and some Drupal 7. And so what that suggests to me is that Drupal 8 has become the go-to version, right? Most new sites launching are on Drupal 8 right now, which is, which is really exciting. At the same time, it also suggests that the transition from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 is still not complete. Right? If the transition were complete, you know, I would expect like 90% or something uh, of all of the new Drupal sites uh, to be on Drupal 8. So we have some work to do. It's also reflected in the adoption test statistics. Um, but things are trending the right direction. Um, the ecosystem has also matured a lot. If we look at the number of stable modules on Drupal.org, you can see that um, the number went up from, you know, roughly 600 stable modules a year ago to over 1,400 modules today. So that's more than a 2x increase. Um, in addition, there's about 4,000 modules which are currently in development, right? So what that suggests is that the ecosystem of modules and projects, themes and distributions, um, you know, are getting uh, more and more ready as well. So really good. Um, specifically um, of interest is also that some of these, you know, infrastructure modules, if you will, these are big modules that a lot of websites use and maybe have other modules depend on it, that they also became ready in the last five months. And so that will also boost the acceleration of Drupal 8. Having said that, there is some more work to do. There's other modules that need to be finished or completed. And, you know, my ask is that you try and get involved this week. You can either you know, crack open your code editor and start writing code and upgrading these modules, or you can uh, fund um, other developers, maintainers, to um, you know, upgrade their modules. There's no lack of people asking for funding to get these modules done. So please get involved. It's a way you can, can really help. Of course, it's not just about the contributed modules. There's about a million Drupal sites uh, using Drupal 7. It's a large number. And a lot of these people have been waiting to migrate to Drupal 8. They haven't been able to do so yet because the migration path hasn't been ready. And so I'm happy to share that we've made a lot of good progress on that as well. There is about 12 critical migrate bugs that are remaining. But once we fix those, the migrate path uh, should be ready. So we're getting really close um, to that as well. Um, I've spent a lot of time traveling uh, lately. I've been the last two months, I was in Australia, um, where I met with, uh, you know, with the Drupal community, and I spent several weeks in Europe before coming here, and then I was in, in America as well. And so in my, in my travels, I get to speak to a lot of people. Um, and it's very clear to me that a lot of people are excited about Drupal 8. And so when I was in Australia, I was talking to 
uh, Kim Pepper from previous Nexts, and he was like visibly excited about Drupal 8, and you know, like he couldn't stop talking about all of the great things in Drupal 8, and so I recorded a little video, um, you know, with Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Pepper from Previous Next in Sydney, Australia. So Drupal 8 has been a game changer for us. We've invested heavily uh, with 20% time, and now we're really starting to see that pay off. So the new architecture really allows you know, new features and enhancements to come into Drupal 8 um, relatively easily. As we're seeing with Drupal 8.4 coming out with content moderation, workflows, media, etc., all being added. And this is big for us because um, having them added into core means we know that they're going to be high quality and stable. Um, the six monthly release cycle has also been a massive um, improvement for us because developers are now able to see that the changes that they, they want to make or the features they want to add or that they're really passionate about could be in Drupal core within one or two release cycles. And I really think that's accelerating the, um, the contribution space. So Previous Next is very proud to be part of Drupal 8's success and we hope to continue contributing into the future. So that's Kim. Yeah. <laughs> Previous Next has been a fantastic contributor, so um, you know, thank you uh, to them. Um, but yeah, like Kim, a lot of people are excited about the um, six-month release cycle. It you know, seems to be really, really working. And so happy to share that next week we have the next six-month release. That will be 8.4, which we hope to release. I believe it's in one week and one day from today. So it's really, really, really close. Um, and those releases are actually starting to accelerate. You know, if you look at the current version of Drupal, Drupal 8.3, we have a set of experimental modules. You can see them on the screen. And if you compare that with the state in 8.4, you see that a lot of these modules um, have made significant progress. You know, four of them will be stable. You know, several are moving to beta. And even the ones that are in alpha have made a lot of progress. It's just that their state didn't necessarily change. Um, and so you can really see that that model really starts working. Yeah. So we're very hopeful that we have some more goodies coming out with 8.5 as well. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's really sort of the synopsis of Drupal is, is growing. You know, what I showed you is uh, community engagement is increasing. We have more and more people contributing, more and more organizations contributing. The Drupal 8 ecosystem is maturing. More and more contributed modules ready, infrastructure modules being ready. Upgrade path is almost ready. You know, it seems like the Drupal 8 release became the de facto release. Many businesses are doing well, and, you know, the acceleration in Drupal 8 appears to be accelerating as well. So, you know, these are all the great things, right? A lot of momentum, at least from my point of view. Now, Drupal is also changing, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that. You know, first of all, I believe that the vendor landscape, the world around Drupal is changing. Right, and um, I think it's it's worth talking about that because there's it's changing in sort of multiple directions, and it can leave some people a little bit confused. Like, what does that mean for Drupal? And so, um, you know, I don't know if you know, but the the CMS market, which is you know our, our market, obviously, <laughs> um, is growing at about 11 percent overall. Um, but then, if you, which is you know maybe relatively slow, I'm not I'm not sure if it's slow, but uh, but if you look in that market, there's a segment of the market, which is the headless or decoupled CMSs. And that little s segment, it's still a relatively small sort of part, is growing incredibly fast. It's growing at over 500% year over year. At the same time, we see that the low end of the market, if you will, the single blogs or maybe the uh, portfolio websites or the brochure websites are best served by software as a service tools today. It's a reality. Um, and, you know, that's what most people use. And then on the complete other side of the spectrum, we have the enterprise, right? And what we see in the enterprise is that for them, you know, content management is a component. It's a feature, but it now became part of a bigger thing, right? So they're starting to build these big suites, and they don't compete on capabilities in the CMS, but they tend to compete 
on capabilities on the marketing side of the house. And so, you know, there's interesting movements, which I think it's useful for us to talk a little bit about. In addition to that, it's not only sort of the vendor landscape that's changing, but also the technology stack seems to be expanding. Um, and again, from the business survey, the Drupal business survey, one of the questions that was asked is, other than Drupal, because these are all Drupal agencies, other than Drupal, what other technologies do you use? And the results are pretty remarkable, right? More than 50% of the Drupal agencies are using Note. And almost, I don't know, you can see the numbers, but a lot of them are using a variety of modern JavaScript frameworks. Um, so that is more proof that this headless or decoupled part of the um, CMS market is really changing and taking off. Um, it's also proved that developers want to use, um, you know, JavaScript. And so, you know, these are some changes. Obviously, it doesn't help that maybe the Drupal 8 release took a long time and that the adoption cycle of Drupal is maybe longer than we all expected. Uh, so these market changes, these technology changes, some of the changes in Drupal, um, and it's basically creating some uncertainty with many people in the community. People wondering, who is Drupal for? Or people that wonder if Drupal is still for them. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that today as well. And so I'm going to start with, who is Drupal for? And so I've actually talked about this before. Um, I've written about this on my blog. I've actually talked about this at DrupalCon uh, Baltimore uh, not too long ago. And I wanted to talk about it again because I think it's important and also because um, I feel that maybe it wasn't heard or understood. And I think getting aligned on who is Drupal 4 will help us focus. It allows us to say, we're not going to do this, but instead we're going to go and do that, right? And so let me try and explain you in a little bit more detail than I have in the past what I mean with you know, Drupal is for uh, ambitious digital experiences. So if I think about Drupal, I think one of the greatest things about Drupal is actually that it scales from small to large, right? That it can serve websites with very little reach or traffic, as well as websites with a lot of reach or traffic. You know, Drupal can power a blog or a portfolio site, but on the other end of the spectrum, Drupal can also power these, let's say, multi-site platforms, the Johnson & Johnsons and advisors that have thousands of Drupal sites. And on aggregate, maybe they're serving billions of page views each month, right? These are complex, um, you know, infrastructures that have lots and lots of reach. Uh, but I actually don't think that reach is the best dimension to look at. I think it's much more interesting to look at richness versus reach. And so if we make it two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional, I think the picture becomes a little bit cl more clear. And so when I say richness, I mean flexibility or customization, you know, these kinds of things. Uh, in a way, it's, you know, maybe complexity too. So if you, if you plot it in two dimensions, it starts to look like this in my mind, which is, you know, I think it really starts to show that Drupal is for sites that have medium to high richness. And what you see is that some of these smaller sites, um, you know, fall out of that. I personally believe that those today are best served by these software as a service builders. You know, and that Drupal is no longer for these simple websites. Um, except maybe when, you know, people are starting to do Drupal as a service, which I know some people are doing, which is very exciting, by the way. And I would definitely encourage people to explore uh, Drupal as a service. Right? But I think this is the reality. Um, and it's, of course, it's a little bit of a simplification because two dimensions don't quite capture um, sort of the complexity of Drupal and where Drupal does really well. I mean, you can see it on the screen. Like you could say, well, with these small sites of a ginormous amount of traffic, well, then Drupal is uniquely qualified to scale that to serve billions of pages. And that's true. <laughs> and so even in this two-dimensional view, you could see it, it's not like as simple as two boxes, but if you then start to add other dimensions into it, it starts to get complex really quick. And that's why I personally believe um, that the term ambitious digital experiences captures it quite well. What I also like about it is that it describes our community. Not only the projects that we do, 
but also the fact that we as a community are pretty ambitious in my mind, right? And so, so some people have said that Drupal is now for the enterprise or just for the enterprise. And, you know, when I think of the enterprise, I think of this little, this piece, so to speak, on the graph. And I agree that Drupal is, is great for the enterprise. Um, but I also believe that Drupal is more than just for the enterprise, right? I think there's a lot of sites that are outside of this white box that Drupal is uniquely qualified uh, to deliver. Um, an example could be a small company. Uh, maybe it's a, a company in Vienna, let's say, that has uh, rental properties. They have 50 re rental units. Um, maybe don't get a lot of traffic because they're in Vienna and they only have 50 properties to rent, but they could have a lot of complexity or richness because they need to integrate with an e-commerce platform, maybe they want to integrate with a booking system, maybe they want to integrate with a support system, and guess what, they want to do all of that with a budget of 50,000 euros or less, right? It's not enterprise, but I do believe that Drupal is uniquely qualified for these kinds of websites which is why I personally take offense when people say Drupal is just for the enterprise. It's more than just for the enterprise. Um, and just like this small company, there's a lot of other companies or organizations. Museums can often be very ambitious and do very cool things. Nonprofits can really engage with their um, stakeholders in unique and different ways that require, let's say, more complex integrations. Uh, or startups, you know, small startups. They could have a big idea and they want to maybe use um, their website to do some pretty amazing things. Like cart.com is actually a great example of a startup using Drupal in, in sort of a big way. And so saying that Drupal is just for the enterprise, I don't think um, is right. And so, you know, where this is a little bit of, of a challenge sometimes is that I think the majority of the Drupal ecosystem is actually sort of in that, in that box, right? And so for a variety of reasons, um, that part of our ecosystem has maybe felt a little bit left behind lately because of, you know, some of the things that are going on. And so that sums up a, a couple of the changes. Um, and I'm going to talk about that more in a second. So, so far I've shown you that Drupal is growing, but that the market around us is changing, that Drupal itself has changed a little bit. I try to explain again who I believe Drupal is for, for ambitious digital experiences. And I've mentioned that, um, you know, quite a few people maybe feel uh, left behind. And so, in my travels, when I listen to people or when I read tweets and blogs and all of these things, I hear a lot of different reasons for why people may feel left behind, right? And you can see some of, the, some of them on the screen. People think Drupal 8 is no longer for simple sites. People think Drupal 8 moves too fast. Maybe people struggle to learn object-oriented programming. You know, updates are expensive. There's a lot of different things going on, um, which doesn't help. Um, I wonder if the connection is bad. All right. And so some of these reasons, I think, are important, but unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to fix those, right? We're not going to undo object-oriented programming. Like, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> we're not going to slow down Drupal 8, especially now we have so much to do, right? So we want you to come on board. We want you to enroll in Drupal 8, but these are the things that you will have to fix. You know, we want you to learn object-oriented programming. Now, some of these other reasons are also really important, um, and those we absolutely have to fix. Right? These are the things that, as a community, we should fix so that these people that I highlighted, the majority of our ecosystem, so that they don't feel left behind. Right? So I'm going to talk about those things next and what I think we should do to make sure that these people feel heard and listened to. There's sort of different ways to look at this, but um, I think two really important pieces of this is, you know, these, um, the companies building these kinds of websites, uh, like the example that I gave, um, 
In my mind, they want more powerful site building tools. They don't want to write a lot of code necessarily. They don't necessarily want to install 20 or 30 modules to get one piece of functionality. Right? And they want to have tools that are easy to use. Um, and I think that's becoming increasingly important, not just for those people, but also in the CMS selection process. One of the clearest trends is that IT is less and less involved in the CMS selection, but that the business side, the marketers and you know, these kinds, are very involved with the CMS selection process. So creating these powerful tools and making them incredibly easy to use uh, is actually really important for Drupal. And the second thing that I heard loud and clear is that you know, updates and maintenance of Drupal 8 specifically is hard. And lots of people are asking, like, let's make it easier. Right? So let's talk about both of them. And I'll start with the site building tool. So we've actually um, taken quite a few steps here to make this better. Uh, we've invested in people and process primarily. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. So on the people site, um, a while ago, we actually created a product management role on the core committer team, which allows us to look um, more sort of outside in into Drupal, like what are the key features that are missing using survey data and things like that. We've also appointed Roy as a core committer to the uh, core committer team, and that's special because for the first time in the history of Drupal, we have a non-developer on the core committer team. You know, so yeah. <laughs> And equally important, I think, um, you know, we have a community. I think increasingly more people here in the audience are passionate about design and user experience. And we're finding ways to um, involve you in, in the design process. Um, and so we've made some process changes too, actually. Um, not sure if you know, but um, in the past, we would often go, just build something and then you know, commit it. And then afterwards, we would find like, oh, actually, maybe we shouldn't have built it this way or designed it to work this way. And so with this new process and, and Roy and others, uh, we've really taken uh, an approach where we start with design and product management. We, you know, we first validate the designs, and then we start implementing them. And throughout the process, we do more testing, um, which, is, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we also created several initiatives, again, a while back, like media, layouts, and workflow that are targeted at these people, you know, the site builders. And those initiatives are using this new process. Um, and you haven't necessarily seen them yet because they're still in the development, you know, in the development process. So these changes were made and they're coming through the pipeline. And so I wanted to preview uh, a couple of those things uh, with you today. So. The first one is the layout builder. Uh, and this is actually showing the new out of the box team, which we implemented. Um, and what we're going to do is create a layout um, for a page. And so you click on the layout uh, button here, and that allows you to you know, add sections. And each section can have its own layout. So here we're going to just pick a one column layout. And then that gives you the opportunity to add a block to the layout. This is, by the way, using. Uh, the settings tray, which is another kind of project to help make Drupal easier to use, uh, that is also um, getting closer to being ready. So we're showing a lot of different things here. But um, as you can see, once the block is selected, you actually get to see it, uh, it is as well. Like you actually get the image to show on the page, which is um, a really nice improvement. Uh, here we selected a two column layout for the next section. So we're going to add, be adding two blocks um, as well. Um, and then once these blocks have been added, we'll show you how you can actually uh, move them around with just uh, drag and drop. Right? I think it's pretty cool. Um, you know, this is actually real, right? So this is actually working. Um, we may have to stabilize it more. We may want to make some more UI tweaks. But as you can see, um, this could be pretty close um, you know, to something that you can, uh, can beta test. So I think it looks fantastic, too. So thanks to all the people. Yeah. Could be a game changer. Um, the next one I want to show you is um, 
uh, is, is workspaces. Um, so workspaces, uh, something that Pfizer actually invested in quite a bit. Um, and so let's say you are, you know, a website for a TV show, like, I don't know, uh, The Voice, right? And you have all of these people singing, and you don't know who's going to win, but you do, whenever somebody wins, you all of a sudden want to publish that on your website. So at Workspaces, as an example, would allow you to do is to prepare a different variant of the website for each of the potential winners. And that it could include different articles, but also menu items and, and things like that. And then when the person that wins, wins, you can publish the right version into production. That's one use case of workspaces. But in general, it allows a lot of different people to work on different sections of the website, to preview them and take them to an approval uh, process and then uh, you know, publish them or deploy them to production. This is something that was maybe a little bit harder to do in the past. And with these things, you don't need to install all these modules and maybe write custom stuff. And uh, it really became a lot easier to use um, with the workspaces module. It builds upon you know, years of work, actually, <laughs> on content moderation and you know, um, making everything versionable and stuff like that. So again, a really cool new improvement that will enable not only content authors, but site builders to be much more effective and efficient. And I think we're delivering it in a way that looks really good and appears to be really easy to use. So very exciting feature. All right, lastly, I want to show you the media library. Um, media, of course, um, ranks always super high in our surveys. Um, and what this is showing you um, is basically um, sort of a media browser. It, it shows you all of the assets that you have. You know, it could be images or videos or slides or documents. And it allows a content creator to pick an image and embed it uh, in a post. I mean, it's really that simple, but it's something that we haven't had. Uh, or haven't had in core, and so um, putting this thing in core will be very helpful, I think, for a lot of um, you know content creators. I don't know why the slides are so flickery, but I'm trying to stay still, see if it helps. <laughs> I don't think it's helping, is it? Um, anyway, so that's some of the stuff that's coming out of the new process. Um, so you haven't seen it yet, you can't use it yet, it's not ready, but it's getting closer and closer uh, to being ready. Now, I like to think that the things I've just showed you are a significant step forward, right? I think huge step forward in terms of usability, but at the same time, I think, you know, let's face it, like the bar is set pretty high nowadays. Um, even if you think about simple things like maybe uploading multiple images, if you think about how Facebook does it, you can literally you know, drag a whole bunch of images, and while the images are uploading, you can start editing the caption and editing the title of the album. I mean, it just all sort of magically uh, happens. And for better or worse, Facebook is used by billions of people, and it's really setting the bar of how things should work. And the reason that organizations like Facebook and others can do that is because um, not just the, the people in the process, but also because of the tools that they have, right? And the reality today is that really good user experience is often built with modern JavaScript. The other reality, as we've seen from the survey results, is that really good user, you know, the developers actually want to use modern JavaScript as well. And so I want to talk about that next and, and make uh, several recommendations. The first recommendation that I have is not necessarily new, um, but because headless and decoupled is taking the world by storm, I actually think we should find ways to invest more in that. And the desired outcome is that people can build headless or decoupled applications with their JavaScript framework or JavaScript libraries of choice, in addition to keeping Twig as well. Right? It's about giving people options, different ways of doing this. Um, and this is what we've been doing around the API First initiative. Now, my second recommendation is actually to consider adding a JavaScript library or framework to core, not for building applications with Drupal or on top of Drupal, but for Drupal's own administrative UIs. 
right? Big difference. And it's important you understand the difference. Um, I think that would be really useful to do because that would allow us to make Drupal easier to use, to provide a better user experience. Like, think about, um, you know, some of the user interfaces that we have around views or the fields UI. We really can make those better, right? And making those kinds of things better really benefits from having JavaScript libraries. Secondly, it would help us attract more JavaScript expertise into Drupal, which I think uh, is really strategic and important given where this, you know, how fast JavaScript is, move, is growing. Um, and third, it would actually allow us to dog food some of our own APIs, our web service API. So there's a lot of good reasons, but the main reason really is to give us the tools to make Drupal's own administrative UIs easier to use. Now, to some of you, that may sound really daunting and scary. Um, and so my third recommendation really is to start small. Like, we don't need to set out to redesign everything in Drupal. <laughs> you know, what I'm proposing is we pick one or we pick maybe two user interfaces, possibly new ones, so we don't have to break backwards compatibility if we don't want to. Um, and build those with a new framework. You know, maybe the new layout builder, as an example. And see, you know, we can start small with one or two things. That gives the, us the opportunity to learn. You know, and if we don't like it, we can undo it. If in the process we um, say, you know what, maybe this JavaScript library would be better, we can test it and swap it. So it gives us some time to figure it out, but it gives us the ability to actually move forward and start learning, which I think is really, really important. So I'm not the best person to pick a JavaScript framework. <laughs> and so what I'm proposing today is that we start a proposed initiative, that we huddle, that we get together this week and, and after DrupalCon to start putting together a plan on how we can accomplish this. And once, once we like the plan, we can, you know, consider activating it at the right time, depending on all the other things we're juggling. But I'd like us to, you know, reconsider the notion of adding a JavaScript framework to core because I do think it's really important. Actually, I think it's so fundamental as maybe the move from table-based layouts to div-based layouts or how people used to have two websites, one for mobile, you know, M dot, and one that was for, you know, the regular desktop. And now they have responsive websites, right? I think, um, I don't know, fast forward 10 years, and I could see a world where most user interfaces are no longer server-side rendered or static, but become increasingly more dynamic and client-side rendered. I really do believe this is a fundamental change in our industry, and I do believe there's a lot of data that is supporting that as well. And so. I think it's important for the long-term longevity of the project as well as for the immediate need for making parts of Drupal easier to use. All right. Does that sound like an idea? Yeah? All right. <laughs> All right. So I want to move on to the second thing, making updates easier, making maintenance easy. Um, talk to several people on my travels and I said, oh, we used to do, you know, Drupal, but then uh, we switched to WordPress or to something else because it was really too expensive to just keep updating Drupal. Like, um, and so we hear that quite a bit. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's something that we uh, should look at. And it's not a surprise because, you know, with Drupal 8, um, you know, we've got a lot of great things, but one of the things we decided to do is to have monthly core updates in addition, we have ad hoc contributed module updates, and we also have six-month core updates. So we have all these updates happening all the time, and the result is people need to be constantly updating um, you know, their sites. Plus, not only do we have more updates, we also have more and more tools, um, Composer and Git, and we have all these third-party libraries that we need to check and keep uh, an update as well. I feel like this is getting worse. <laughs> Everybody feeling okay? <laughs> I don't know what to do about it, though. Well, maybe I should stay here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and stay here. <laughs> um, all right, so it's very clear to me that what users really want is auto-updates, um, you know, because it, it addresses a lot of the concerns. It addresses the concerns of the upgrade process is too manual, 
It requires very expensive talent to keep updating Drupal every month. And frankly, it would be a security best practice too. If you think about what happened just a few weeks ago in the US, because somebody didn't upgrade uh, open source components, right? it really damages the brands of, um, you know, in this case, um, not Drupal, but you know, if this were to happen with Drupal, it would really damage Drupal's brand. And so auto updates, I think, would be huge. You know, I recognize it's not for everyone, and some people don't want it, and that's fine. But I would say most people clearly want it. Whenever we bring up this topic, there's all sorts of complaints and concerns uh, about security, or maybe we need to add a lot more testing, because what if we break one of those sites? And there's a lot of concerns. But here's what I do know as well, is that the best organizations in the world have figured out how to do this. You know, if you even look at Apple or Microsoft, I mean, there's a lot of examples. They do auto upgrades. They do updates of an operating system, which I would think is a lot more complex than a Drupal site, right? And so if they can do it, we should be able to do it um, over time. And in many ways, we're evolving in the right direction, which is really exciting. Um, you know, we started with manual updates way back when, and then we had Drush that helps with updates, which I'm sure um, many here use. We added an update manager in Drupal 7, makes it a little bit easier to, to track updates at least. And in Drupal 8, we introduced Composer as an example to help with the dependency management. And there's a lot of good reasons to, to use Composer. Um, but if you actually look at the data, you know, and we did this with the Drupal Association, they looked at what are people actually using. What we see is that almost 60% of Drupal's users are still manually downloading modules from D2D. Right? So that suggests that while Drush and Composer are great, they're not universally adopted. And it doesn't, you know, it leaves 60% of the people behind, or almost 60% of the people behind. And if you include Drupal 7 data, it's actually worse uh, than these numbers. So um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, you know, we don't really promote Composer. If you go to the update manager, we still encourage people to download um, Drupal versus maybe give Composer instructions. I mean, there's a long list of things we can do. Um, but um, actually, where I think we should go to um, is, is this notion of auto-updates. And again, just like with the JavaScript framework, we don't have to get there in one step, right? I really think we can take this step by step. And so what I'd like to recommend or propose is that we you know, start maybe, you know, simple between quotes. And simple could be, you know, maybe we just do auto updates for security releases only, security patches only, and maybe for core only as a first step. And we can learn, we can experiment, we can test the infrastructure, we can see how it goes. And then once we've mastered that, maybe we expand it to core and contrib. And maybe once we did that, maybe we can do auto updates for all patch releases not just security releases. And eventually, we can get to maybe minor updates, right? So again, instead of trying to boil the ocean and trying to do everything at once, we can start simple. Um, this one is hard, I think. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, because uh, there is a lot to figure out. I'm not going to talk about all of these things, but <laughs> there's clearly a lot to figure out from the infrastructure side to, you know, Drupal stuff and, you know, and so, what I would like to propose today, again, um, is that we have a proposed initiative to do auto-updates, and that we huddle, that we get together, and that we start sketching out what it would take to do auto-updates. Are you guys on board with that? Yeah? <laughs> Sounds like a yes. <laughs> I'm sure we'll debate it, but I'll take it as a yes for now. Um, all right, so these are, um, I think, the two biggest things we can do to make sure that um, a certain group of us don't feel left behind. And I recommend that we start optimizing for that. I think if we do, do these two things, a lot of the complaints or frustrations or concerns that I've heard would disappear. I'm not saying it fixes everything, but I think these are two really important buckets. Um, and it would... I think it would make a lot of people feel like they would um, be able to come along instead of feeling left behind, um, which, as I said, is really important. 
I think we're lucky that we have a very large community of contributors, right? Because making this happen is not going to be easy. Like, we have to really organize ourselves. And we're lucky that we have so many people contributing. Um, at the same time, some of these things are really complex. And they're also really time sensitive. And there's a set of organizations in our community that tirelessly contributes on the hardest parts of Drupal. You know, really meaningfully code contributions to address some of these uh, tough problems. And so I wanted to recognize them because this is a set of problems like those. Right? And so we need to find ways to support these kinds of organizations um, in the Drupal project. Um, and one such organization is uh, Commerce Guys. Um, they've been a, yeah. I bet they're here somewhere. Um, but, you know, Commerce Guys is a relatively small company that has a massive impact on Drupal. And so what I wanted to do is show you a little video that I recorded with them because I want you to see how they do it, why they do it, and hopefully again get inspired by um, what the commerce guys are doing. So here's the video. Oh, no audio. 2005, 2006, and I, I really kind of developed a reputation in the Drupal community for creating Uber Cart um, with my co-maintainer and popularizing that as the e-commerce solution for Drupal 5 and Drupal 6. And then I founded Commerce Guys in 2009, originally to deliver services around Ubercart. Um, but when we had to change our strategy, uh, I ended up developing Drupal Commerce instead. Up until last year, I had partners in Commerce Guys. In February 2016, I spun the business out, and now I'm the, the owner, president, and CEO of the company uh, with my two partners, Matt and Moya. My name is Mike Lavin. Um, I'm a senior Drupal consultant or Commerce Guys out of Southeast Wisconsin. There I'm co-maintainer of Drupal Commerce 2 and a bunch of other contrib. My name is Bojan Jovanovic and I'm a Drupal contributor from Serbia and I'm the lead developer of Drupal Commerce 2 x which is our rewrite of Drupal Commerce for Drupal 8. So back in 2010, I was looking for ideas for my Summer of Code projects and since I was already maintaining this uh, contrib module for Ubercart for Drupal 6, I figured it would be great to learn Drupal 7 and write it for Ubercart for Drupal 7 and then I came across Ryan's blog post uh, called A Rose by Any Other Name, uh, which announced the creation of Drupal Commerce. And I said, that would be pretty amazing. So I created this plan, and then unexpectedly he said, well, I could just mentor you. Uh, so th that was the beginning of one uh, very long friendship. E-commerce is difficult. There's a lot of use cases. And every single site that I've helped implement, we've overridden parts of Drupal Commerce for a need. And previously with Drupal 7, overriding parts was near impossible unless you copy-pasted an entire module set. Uh, but with the Drupal 8 architecture, we're able to tell the core service container, actually, we're going to use our implementation logic. I think that, that what we are doing wouldn't be possible for a team of our size and with our level of resources anywhere else. Um, the, the strength of Drupal is this like, collaborative environment that we are a part of where we get to benefit from, from everybody's work and knowledge and experience and wisdom. It's really important to us to, to maintain like a, a pretty high level of contribution. Uh, so even from day one as the new company, when we were just three people, Boyan was still a full-time contributed module developer. So Matt and I did the, the work, the income, you know, the, the revenue generation that, that allowed us to pay ourselves and keep Boyan fully dedicated to Drupal Commerce. And then also ensure that, that Matt at least had that one day a week to continue to contribute to core as well. And, and just through some, some good sales work, you know, we were able to get contracts in place that continued to fund core development, whether that was, you know, projects coming in through BlueSpark or Acromedia that were big Drupal 8 projects that funded Commerce 2.x work, or even just some like heroes who just showed up, like Think Me up in Boston, who literally just gave us money and said, we don't want anything from you. 
we just want you to use this to book more of Matt's time to Commerce 2.0. Uh, and so what, what happened was that you know, we've maintained this spot in the list of all Drupal companies contributing to Drupal because of our activity, despite being, you know, a, a fraction of their size. I think even right now we're, we're hovering somewhere around, you know, 300 commits in the last 90 days. And that, that's spread between our commerce projects, core work, and other contributed modules um, that, that are our sort of uh, dependencies of or tangential to Drupal commerce. We can get a lot of return value by giving back. Because, yes, we're technically competing for some projects, but there's such a market share that we can all greatly benefit by sharing more information, such as code, domain knowledge, and different tutorials. So that's the commerce, guys. Well. A huge, huge thanks to them, um, because they have, you know, done a lot to make Drupal more powerful, not just Drupal Commerce, but Drupal itself, more powerful and, and much more easier to use. And I mean, to me, this is a, a, a very compelling example. I know there's other examples, but the idea that a relatively small company, you know, feel that they can accomplish more with Drupal 8 than they could accomplish with anything else out there, you know, is, is pretty powerful, especially if you think about what they're doing, like building a commerce platform, which is probably one of the most complex things to do. Um, not only that, that in the process of doing that, they can actually meaningfully contribute to Drupal 8 as well. Not only do they give or get much, they also are giving much back to the project. And um, I, th I think it's just an incredible example. And, and I hope that you know, they, they inspire all of you uh, to contribute as well as to, uh, to take from Drupal. So um, to me, that's the Drupal way. Um, and so if you wanted to get involved more with Drupal, if you want to contribute to Drupal, this is the week. <laughs> I mean, you're in the right place at the right time to get involved. There's people that can help you. Um, so I encourage you to enjoy your DrupalCon and um, come talk to any of us about getting involved. Um, thank you very much. I feel like I debugged the stage by the end of my talk. If I stayed there, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rachel. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Want to sit down? Yeah. Okay. So, a couple of Q and A's from the yep. audience. Starting with an Austrian-themed one. Okay. Nice and easy to get in there to start with. Do you know how to prepare the schnitzel? <laughs> I know, but I think it involves using a hammer and slamming <laughs> on the chicken, or whatever, the beef, or... <laughs> I think we probably need somebody in the audience later to show you how to yeah, do it. I'd love to, actually. <laughs> Didn't like a workout. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good, actually. Um, okay, so moving on to some specific European things. Uh, what would a European Drupal camp need to do that would interest you to coming all the way from the US, or actually wherever you are, it's, you, you, you travel so much. What would get you right. here? It's a good question. Um, so the way I tend to organize um, my work, I guess, <laughs> is, is optimizing for impact. Um, and you know, I think most people do this, like I wake up in the morning and I like, you know, what can I do that would optimize my impact on Drupal? Um, and the challenge that I often have with camps, because I get invitations often to come and keynote, typically, I've seen several times. Yeah, um, to, to come and keynote their camp, is that while I love doing those things, you know, for me to be on stage and to deliver a message, you know, from the stage to the audience um, for maybe 200 or 500 people isn't always, and I mean this respectfully, isn't always the best or biggest impact for me. You know, if you think about the time it takes to get there and all of these things. And so, and, but I love doing that. But so one, one thing we can make that much more interesting for me is um, if we could, you know, I actually, to do what I do, I need to listen constantly to people. And so for me, the value wouldn't be 
I understand that the value for the audience could be the keynote, but for me the value would be um, to have maybe an organized listening session, you know, round tables where I can talk to the key uh, influencers or key players in the community and in, in like a half a day or a day or, you know, whatever time frame, we can get really deep on some topics and some of these things become really actionable and, and that kind of stuff. That would be very interesting to me and yes. would be very compelling for me to travel and, and, yeah. and be at your camp and do a keynote as well, <laughs> you know. So, so it sounds like you want to listen as much as speak and do keynotes. Yeah, I listen, I listen more than I speak. <laughs> but yes, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, you know, if we can sort of organize listening sessions, I don't know what to call it, I think that would be, that would be very valuable to me. And I'm sure it would be valuable to the other people attending too because it would allow me to interact in a different way versus just the keynote, like we would have conversations, debates, and, and move things forward that way, which, yeah. so I Alex, encourage you to do to that. that. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm wearing, this, this is a, there's a lovely uh, Drupal t-shirt hash, hashtag going on Twitter at the moment, people tweeting their favorite Drupal t-shirts. Um, I'm wearing my DrupalCon London, uh, London, uh, yeah, um, T-shirt today, Croydon, yeah, um, and because it was where I first changed from being a Drupal consumer to being a member of the community and getting involved in volunteering, etc., uh, and doing all sorts of things now. Um, can you think of a T-shirt that you own that's special to you and why? Yeah, I have a lot of T-shirts. <laughs> I keep them in like memory boxes and I mean it's like half of our storage unit is full of Drupal t-shirts. Um, so it's hard to pick one. <laughs> um, but I do have all of my DrupalCon t-shirts. I've, I've never missed a DrupalCon as an example. Um, but, you know, but, I, but I guess I'm going to highlight my, my first ever Drupal t-shirt. <laughs> um, I can give you a little bit of the background. Um, uh, so this, this was 2004, I believe, and so at the time I was a student at the University in Ghent, I was doing my PhD, and I had a, a presentation accepted at, at Uppsala, which I don't know if you know Uppsala, but it's, in my field, it was sort of the most important conference, and it's where they first presented object-oriented programming uh, and things like that, so it was, uh, anyway, but, and so I go to Vancouver, where Uppsala was, and some people in Vancouver, I think Boris Mann and James Walker, they said, hey, let's do a Drupal meetup. And I was like, what? A Drupal meetup? <laughs> because, I mean, you have to remember, like, Drupal was sort of my site thing, right? I would do it at night, on the weekends. I was very passionate about it, but it wasn't necessarily something that I talked to my friends about all that much. And so it's like sort of a, a basement thing. And, for me, it was like, wow, we're going to have a meetup and talk about Drupal? That sounds pretty cool. And so they put together this event in 2004 in Vancouver, and it's where I gave my very first Drupal presentation. I'd never given a presentation on Drupal. And yeah, and they made a t-shirt with just a Drupalicon logo. And I was like, wow. And, and so that's a very special t-shirt because um, for a variety of reasons, because one, a bunch of people actually flew out to Vancouver, which was even more surprising, like Neil Drum and I think Zach Rosen, I think, was there as well, and you know, maybe Kieran. So a lot of sort of the old timers that went off and did great things for Drupal, they, they were there. And also, at that event, um, I mean, and when I say event, it was like one presentation in a bar, and then we were sitting in a hotel room with eight of us drinking beers. <laughs> while coding, um, you know, so we, we had so much fun. We said, wow, this is really cool. We had so much fun that we decided that we would keep doing this. And so I went back home in Belgium, and that's when I said, you know, we're going to do a DrupalCon. We're going to sort of raise the bar and organize a real DrupalCon. And that's how DrupalCon was born. And so this first T-shirt, I still have it. I, I don't think it fits me <laughs> anymore. <laughs> It was very skinny, Dries. Um, it was, was very important because it, it was how DrupalCon was born, how I actually started talking about Drupal, and first time we, a, a bunch of us got together in person, and yeah, it was a pretty big game-changing event. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, 
I'm, I'm afraid that we, we haven't got any more time for questions because uh -oh. we were a bit behind. And I've got so many more to ask uh, that have come in from the audience. And now I've got all this Thanks time with you. I've got loads to ask as well. But I really need to hand off back to Rachel. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>